Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to welcome you here to uh, Innis Town Hall. My name is Peter Lowen, and I'm the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. And it's my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome you tonight for this uh, uh, Cadario Visiting Lecture in Public Policy with uh, Margaret Levy, who's joining us from uh, Stanford University. Margaret is uh, many, many things. I'll just say uh, two things about her um, uh, in a moment. But before I do that, I want to just acknowledge a couple of things. One is I want to acknowledge the traditional land on which the University of Toronto operates. It is traditionally the home of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, we're very lucky to be here at the traditional uh, place of Tidal Creek uh, and to uh, work and live and play and thrive in a place which is uh, where the same is still done by many uh, Indigenous uh, Canadians, Indigenous people, excuse me. The second uh, thing I wanted to do was just acknowledge uh, Paul Cadario. Where's Paul? There's Paul, who uh, whose generosity makes uh, this lecture series and so many other things at the Monk School of Public Policy and Global Affairs uh, possible. So if you'll join me in a, in a round of applause and thanks for Paul. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Now I'll just say I'll say uh, uh, three things about about Margaret uh, Levy and then invite her to uh, to give this uh, lecture on uh, political uh, equality. One are the you know the biographical notes. She was a longtime professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. Spent time at the University of Sydney at the U.S. Studies Center there, and in the last uh, most recent phase of her career was the director of the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences at Stanford University, which. If you know it now, you'll know is the is the is the best institute for advanced study in the world, uh, and it's returned to that place of prominence because of Margaret's remarkable leadership there. Uh, the second thing uh, I'll tell you about Margaret is that um, when I happen to have been a fellow, there's no correlation here, Margaret, but when I happen to have been a fellow at Casbis, uh, as it's called, that was the year in which she won the Johann Skype Prize uh, for a, a lifetime of contributions to political science, and political scientists, of course, recognize that properly as the as the most uh, important and uh, and well deserved award we can give someone in uh, in our discipline. Um, and the third thing I'll say is that is that Margaret, as an academic, has uh, built a career of combining very important, pressing, uh, enduring, normative questions. That's questions about what we want and how the world should be, and brings to them uh, the highest degree of social scientific uh, rigor. So there's a combination in her work and in her in her uh, in her approach to our to our Kind of social science endeavor, which is characterized by a real serious concern about how the world should be and a, and a real wrestling with how the world is. And I think you'll see in her lecture today that uh, it's really up to that mark. This is a person with a penetrating, inquisitive mind who can see a better world uh, and is trying to uh, help us grasp how we can get there. So without further ado, let me just uh, ask you to join me in welcoming to the podium, Margaret Levy. Okay, let me just move the slide here. That's a clicker. Okay, I think this works just as well. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. I, I come from Stanford, as was noted, and that is the, the traditional land of the Ohlone people. And I want to acknowledge them and as Peter knows, we also collect Australian Aboriginal art. And so I am indebted to many indigenous people living and deceased. And they are peoples who have suffered from significant political as well as economic inequality. So it's part of my inspiration actually in doing this work to think about the peoples whose work we collect and whose land um, we now live on. The paper that I'm gonna present is really the beginning, is that the screen falling down? Um, <laughs> is really the beginning of a book. Um, so my two co-authors, Tim Besley, who's at LSE, and Pablo Baramendi from Duke, and I began this project uh, because we were asked by Angus Deaton, a Nobel winner in econ, um, to write a paper on political equality. Uh, Angus had been asked to put together a report on economic inequality, largely focused on Britain, but not only on Britain. And Tim and he, Tim who was helping with putting together this very complicated and big report, um, felt very strongly, they both felt very strongly that one had to also address political inequality and the ways in which that might interact 
with economic inequality. So that gave birth to this project. So the paper, which I know Peter has read and some of the graduate students will have read and maybe others as well, and it's, it's widely available, it's on the web. That's the paper, Political Equality, what, what is it and why does it matter? And you can get it from the Deaton Review. Um, led us to have a series of discussions about where we really wanted to take this project. And the question that I've put up here is really the question that's animating us. What would it mean to live in a community of political equals? And that is a contested question, as I will try to elaborate a little as we go along. For me, political equality is an important value, I'm gonna emphasize that, but it's also one we have to interrogate because there are trade-offs in absolutely everything we do. So understanding what we get with political equality, what it means, what we trade off is part of what I want to address. I also want to apologize because this talk is not a polished talk at all. Um, we're really at the, in, in a sense, recommencing this project. We just met for a week in London to talk about it. And so ideas we thought were settled turned out to be unsettled. And I'm exploring as I talk. Um, I've written some notes to myself to help guide me and you, but I'll be really interested, particularly in the conversation with the graduate students tomorrow, about what you take away from this and how I could improve it. And I know Peter's already got some questions that he wants to ask me. Okay, let's start with just an illustration of the kind of problem um, that we're facing. So when I think about political equality, I'm particularly interested in it, in it in the context of contemporary democracies. And if you look at the history of democracy, suffrage and universal suffrage or anything beginning to approach that is a really recent phenomenon in the history of humankind. It's a blip. And it went up pretty fast. From 1850 to 2000, you get almost 100% suffrage. Now, I have to contextualize that immediately because different countries obviously define citizenship in different ways. Uh, Switzerland, as we know, excluded women until the 1970s. Um, the US excluded blacks until the 1960s, basically, even though officially they didn't, we didn't. Um, but so depending on the definition of citizenship, but now suffrage is basically at 100%. It can't go up any further without expanding the notion of citizenship. So the history of democracy has been a history of expanding suffrage as a, the vote, as a way of ensuring greater political equality. And that leads us into the immediate question of how do we even think about political equality? What is it? Is it suffrage? Is that an equation with political equality? I'm gonna argue, no. It's a dimension, but only one dimension. So in asking this question of what would it mean to live in a political community, a community of political equals, there's both a normative question at the root of that as um, Peter pointed out, I think a lot about questions where you have to marry the normative and the empirical. And in this case, both are at issue here. And our, our intention, my co-authors and I, is to answer both the normative question and the empirical question. Normatively for us, political equality is an intrinsic good. It's something that we believe should be achieved. It is part of what democracy is both built on and builds. That's part of what makes democracy is instrumental to helping to achieve political equality. But that's our belief, but we need to understand how it does that. And we need to understand if it can in effect do that. What gets lost in the process and are those losses to political equality worth the gains? So there's an empirical question there too. There's an, eva an empirical evaluative question about what do we get and what do we lose from political equality, depending of course on how we define it. And I'll get back to that. So if we can adequately conceptualize 
political equality, we, begin, we can begin to use it more effectively as a normative standard. But its conceptualization also, and its refined conceptualization also allows us to measure it, to see where there's more of it, where there's less of it, why it varies in amount and difference across countries, across time, across populations, to assess the trade-offs. And let me make that very concrete. I always go back to John Stuart Mill here and his concern about the vote as suffrage began to be extended in Great Britain was he was worried, he was not in favor of universal suffrage. The great liberal, John Stuart Mill, was not in favor of universal suffrage because he saw a trade-off. You would have an electorate, you would open the electorate to people who one, didn't care, they may or may not vote, two, didn't necessarily get informed, and he was a bit of an elitist, weren't adequately educated as well. But you can see that the issue of the informed voter, the caring voter, the intensity of preferences continues to be a debate within our polities about how we should really treat the suffrage and what its trade-offs are. It also, by conceptualizing it in a way that we can begin to measure it and see it and analyze it as an empirical reality, also allows us to begin to see that multiple equilibria might exist, that there isn't just one way to achieve political equality. Depending on the values of a particular society, certain aspects of political equality might be traded off for other aspects of political equality or different ways of achieving it may be valued over others. So there's a big comparative dimension to this research that goes across countries, but also, as I said, across time, because we want to understand why it changes and what the pressures are to keep it the way it is or to transform it. I should say a little bit about the scope conditions of the empirical study. We are in the process of establishing them, but we're basically looking largely at advanced capitalist democracies but we've picked a set of countries that we're gonna explore a little more in depth that cover a bit of the range of that. It's not, not just Western democracies. Um, I think we're gonna be looking at Turkey. We'll probably be looking at India, again, as, as sort of vignettes rather than full length studies. Okay, there's some additional uh, preliminaries or provisos or emphases that I wanna make. So when we think about equality, the way people generally think about equality, whether it be economic or political, is in distributional terms. Who has more or less, right? And that, of course, is the focus of the Deaton Review on economic inequality and economic equality as a distributional problem. It's largely what economists think about when they think about those kinds of questions. The approach to political equality has also more rather than less been a distri distributional approach. Who has more or less power? Who has more or less influence? Now distributions of income, wealth, and influence, political influence, certainly affect political equality. Here I'll go to this figure. Is that figure three? Yes. Um, but political equality, and, and this figure makes it look as if political equality and e economic equality are highly correlated. And they are, but we don't know how political equality is really being defined here. It's being defined only as political participation, right? There are other dimensions of political equality that we want to address. So we're problematizing this kind of graph and this kind of way of thinking about the, the issue. So we argue that even though distributions of income, wealth, and political influence can certainly affect political equality, political equality cannot simply be reduced to those features. It is instantiated in social relations and in interactions. It's not just about individuals in a an, in an narrowly economic framework finding their position relative to each other. Their actual social relations and interactions 
actions that are crucial to what we mean by political equality. I'll quote another uh, paper from the review by Deborah Satz, a philosopher, and um, blocking his name now, Doug White, I think, who's also a philosopher. A society enjoys equality when its social relations are free of unaccountable power, stigma, and groveling, right? Free of unaccountable power, stigma, or groveling. That's not distributional. That's about who's affecting me or you and whether you feel comfortable acting in that society. So for us, political equality, and I'm going to keep repeating this, is an intrinsic good valuable in its own right. And it may have instrumental value as well, but it's still a goal unto itself. And that's how we're thinking about it normatively. And as I said, we may be proved wrong. We're willing to, we're opening ourselves to that possibility. Okay, so how do we go about, since we wanna be able to ultimately get to measurement here, and I'm not gonna spend time on statistics and measurement though the paper, does, and my co-authors are much better at that than I am, and so is Peter, so he may let him make that case um, at this moment. Um, when we think about how we're going to start conceptualizing this issue in a way that we can ultimately measure it, we start with the notion that comes from classic American democratic theory, which is equal consideration. It's actually been pretty well adopted universally. But some of the earliest uh, renditions of this come from people like Robert Dahl, uh, who said in various places, but I'm quoting him from 1991, but he said it much, much earlier in a different form. In cases of binding collective decision to be considered as an equal is to have one's interest taken equally into consideration by the process of decision-making. What does that mean? It means one person, one vote. That's fundamentally what it means. Sid Verba also emphasized one of the great theorists of political participation in multiple dimensions, suffrage being but one of them, um, also emphasized equal consideration. Voices are equally expressed and given an equal hearing. Slightly different thing there. It's not just one person, one vote. It's also that you could be represented, that you're listened to, that there's some chance that the political system will be responsive to you and at least hear you. In fact, if you think about the history of Dahl's work in some of his early work, he didn't worry about whether people could be heard, just if they could be, if they could vote. Um, he revised his view of democracy after the civil rights movement and recognized that he had not paid adequate attention to groups of people who had not been sufficiently had voice and be able to be heard in the political process. So equal consideration from the political scientist's point of view has led to thinking very strongly about things like participation, both as suffrage and as other kinds of forms, begins to get at some representation issues and may get at some responsiveness questions. What we're gonna emphasize is the three components. But there's another literature that I want to bring in here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it here. I will have to spend some time on it in the book, which is from the, the philosophical tradition, the political philosophy and the political theory tradition that isn't necessarily empirical, but is thinking hard about questions of equality. And here I'm thinking about notions of capabilities that comes from Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, and issues of relational equality, most recently really pushed by Elizabeth Anderson in some stunning work, but also uh, picked up by Philip Pettit, Deborah Satz, and Daniel Allen in her work on difference without domination. So really thinking about what it means to be in a set of social relations that give you dignity, respect, treat you with honor, and listen, give you the capacities to speak up, to be heard, to participate, to be a representative, should you so choose. So giving people the capacities to act politically, the kinds of tools and skills they need, that's not necessarily formal education, but it is a set of skills and tools and capabilities and resources 
that people need. And then understanding that they are embed, people are embedded within a social structure and set of interactions, which may or may not recognize them as fully human and with rights and voice. So our work is informed by this form of political philosophy. It's very informed by that. But the central puzzle is how to identify and measure equal consideration. So it only comes into play that political philosophy as it helps us to really think about dimensions that we have to consider in our research. So our emphasis is really largely on the processes that facilitate equal consideration. But assessing those processes and assessing whether there is equal consideration in practice is far from straightforward as we <laughs> keep rediscovering. And I'm sure we'll keep rediscovering. We'll come to a conclusion, but it won't be the final conclusion. Hopefully none of my books are ever the final conclusion. They open up new puzzles. Um, that people have to explore, hopefully put to rest a few puzzles or a few questions, but they open new ones. And that's going to be the case here. I can already tell. Okay, so we focus on three broad dimensions of, what, of the processes of politics. The first, obviously, I've already mentioned them all, particip participation, representation, and responsiveness. Most of the research to date has been on participation. Not all, I mean, there is good research on those other dimensions as well. Um, but most of the research has been on participation. And here I'll go remind you of figure one, which is about the suffrage. And we'll look at figure two, which is, here's the suffrage, which has gone way up, but turnout keeps going down. This is looking at a number of countries with uh, long-standing democracies. So participation, even in the standard definition of it, remains a puzzle. Why does it go up? Why does it go down? Why does it vary in different places? What does it mean? Is it only the vote? No, it's not only the vote. We know that. It's also various kinds of organization, various kinds of social movements, mobilization. All of those things are ways in which people participate in a political process so that they can get their voices heard and their ideas considered. I have made an argument on several occasions about labor unions. And I think the loss of labor unions in the United States and other countries, not only the United States, their decline has been a serious loss to our political process. They, were, they have been traditionally a very important source of lobbying of mobilizing a set of voters and publics, of making sure that a debate is actually civil because they help set the terms of that debate. So they represent a certain kind of voice which needs to be represented in the polity, but they also mobilize on behalf of those voices and those concerns in ways that without it, we see a lesser polity, I think. It changes the kinds of policies that get raised and discussed and passed. It changes the agenda, but it also changes um, the forms of pressure and who gets heard and who feels that they are being listened to. Okay, so that's participation. The second dimension is representation. And I would argue that's equally important. And there, again, there's research on representation there's more research coming out now than I've seen in a long time. We just, I'm one of the editors of something called the Annual Review of Political Science. And we've just had two essays that are about to come out on political representation. Some, one of them looking really very carefully at um, the kind of who, who, is, who are our representatives? What do they actually look like? Um, do they represent us demographically in terms of color, in terms of gender, in terms of those kinds of things, apart from whether they're substantively representing us, which are two different dimensions of representation? And how much do those signifiers matter um, in terms of representation? Is that a way in which those of us who don't see ourselves in the legislatures or in the presidencies or the prime ministerships, 
um, feel, we know that when Obama was elected, a large proportion of the black population of the US suddenly felt a kind of respect and dignity that they had never felt before within the, the, the national polity. So there's something to that form of representation, but there's also another side of representation, which really has to do is our issues being represented. Are the voices, whoever is doing the representation, whether they're a white rich lawyer or a poor black woman who made it out of poverty and is now in the legislature, are they actually representing the publics that they were elected to represent? And what does that mean when we have diverse publics within the same voting district, let alone the national? So it, representation is a complex problem which we're trying to sort out in order to measure it. The first kind is pretty easy to measure. We know, for example, that it's still disproportionately people from high elite educational institutions tend, tend to be white men, often lawyers, are disproportionately the representatives in legislatures. But that might not be the only way to measure. In fact, we know it's not the only way to measure representation. The third issue is even thornier. So participation is fairly straightforward, not totally, but fairly easy. Representation gets thorny pretty quickly. The hardest one, and here I actually should turn to Peter because he's doing some of the really landmark work and cutting edge work on political responsiveness, is really figuring out what it means to be politically responsive. It's not just representation. It's not just seeing what the issues are for your particular constituency and then somehow voicing them. It's also responding to the diverse kinds of demands that can come from a public and figuring out a way to translate them into a policy that actually satisfies them. So it's not just voting, it's actually crafting policies, programs, reactions that matter to the people who are out there. Now, here's where the tragedy of COVID and all the hardships that we went through actually gave us some fabulous data. And you can see this in many studies, including some of Peter's. Using the COVID data, we could begin to identify what governors, what mayors, what provincial heads were responsive and who weren't to what was actually going on on the ground to their populations. These weren't necessarily framed as political demands, but these were actual concerns and needs that the public had. Okay. Now, those of you who know my work know that I don't just look at process. I also care a lot about institutions and institutions defined as rules of the game, those things that constrain the behavior of all of us, the rules, the laws, the norms that are more or less formalized. Really comes down to the question of how do we hold anybody accountable? Who guards the guardians? How do we ensure that within this framework where people are trying to be, let's say, give them their best shot at being representative and responsive, that they actually have their feet held to the fire to do that. And as we can see, there's less of that going on these days in many democracies than there used to be. So we're looking at not only the rules, the kind of Madisonian structure of rules to set up to make sure that we can't be taken advantage of by the knaves, but we're also looking for the norms that guide behavior of elected officials, judges, bureaucrats. Those are rules of the game. They may be more informal, they may be a little harder to enforce, maybe not. Depends again on context, context is critical here. Um, but those are also important. And as we see those break down, we see representation break down, we see participation break down, we see these other things break down because they affect the extent the ways in which rules are being upheld and norms are being abided by affect the extent to which government officials are perceived as trustworthy. We don't only wanna rely on their personal motivations. 
people's personal motivations can get all messed up for lots of different reasons, good and bad. We wanna rely on some norms and some rules that actually constrain their behavior. And when we feel that those norms and rules are strongly in place, we're more likely to have some confidence in our government officials than when they start to break down. And that affects compliance and it affects consent and it affects participation. Now we may be able to assure a, a kind of, certain kind of Weberian form of equality of treatment in our bureaucracies that is dispassionate, not paying attention to who's actually in front of us, but what that need is or what that category is, going by the rules. But here's where there's a trade-off, one of the many trade-offs. Treating people dispassionately and equally in a bureaucratic sense is not always the best or most responsive way to deal with them. We're learning in our bureaucracies that we have to be a little more attentive to who is actually in front of us and what their particular needs are and where they come from. Um, a friend of mine named Hillary Cottom, who wrote a fabulous book called Radical Help and who is transforming the welfare system in Britain. And she's doing it by thinking about how to reconstruct those agents of the bureaucracy, be they police, be they social workers, be they healthcare workers, be those the mental health care workers who are taking care of people with addiction or depression, how to turn them into a unit as opposed to being different actors dealing with each person's particular problem and not even treating the whole person, let alone treating the whole family as a unit and in a in a coordinated way. So really starting with the family unit or the, the suffering individual, seeing what their total needs are, as opposed to just going to the door with the police officer because the kid was truant from school or dealing with the mental health issue, but not dealing with the unemployment issue of the particular individual and the family and the family unit. So we have to, you know, in thinking about equality, we have things built into our bureaucratic systems, but they may not be working. So part of thinking about and problematizing political equality is also thinking about the transformations that have to occur. That again, there's not gonna be one equilibrium. There's not gonna be one answer that's gonna fit for all ages and all times. And we've gotta be constantly rethinking that. But it also forces us back and that example of the welfare system forces us back to remembering that this is about relationships and certain kinds of transactions that require recognition and not just the rules of the game. Okay, the next issue I want to raise, I told you this talk would be a little disjointed, but this is this is one very close to my heart. Am I, am I doing okay on time, Peter? Okay. Okay, great. The next issue is political power. We really do have to confront political power. As I said, we don't wanna just think about political equality in terms of distributional issues of political power, but there are political power is clearly something that's gonna affect political equality. People have too much political power, too much political influence. It's hard to feel respected if you have very little of it relative to others, or if you feel that every time you manage to mobilize and get in front of your legislators or whoever you wanna, someone comes in with a big check and wins the day, right? So there has to be some leveling of that field. But I wanna point out that there are two kinds of political power. One is compatible with political equality, at least under the right circumstances, and one is definitely not, it undermines it. So the first, the kind that is acceptable, is authority granted through democratic processes. The establishment of hierarchical power in and of itself is not a bad thing, as long as it's done in a way that is democratically accountable, right? We want to have someone able to enforce the laws. We want to have teachers in the schools who have some authority about the classroom. Um, so 
hierarchical power and legal coercion are inherent features of a representative system and an accountable bureaucracy. We delegate. We're representative democracies. None of, none, none of the countries we're talking about are fully participatory democracies. They're representative democracies. We as citizens delegate power to someone to speak for us. That's a form of hierarchical power and that's part and parcel of the system and need not undermine political equality as long as everyone has the opportunity, the capacities and is not blocked by various kinds of ways that prevent them from voting or other things um, to actually express themselves, to have equal consideration. But there is another kind of power which is to be avoided. A government, uh, what we want to avoid is a government that serves those with sources and forms of influence that should be made irrelevant to democratic decision making. Disproportionate influence over policy outcomes that is a result of advantages bestowed by money or position or superior technology and its manipulation distorts participa participation, representation, and responsiveness. Democracies in principle are designed to counter such anti-democratic influences. And when they do not, the effect is to re reveal how unfair governmental procedures and processes are, and thus undermine the trustworthiness of government itself. Okay, so we, in a form, those of you who might know the old power literature, this is a way of reviving and revitalizing the three faces of power with which I was schooled as a student. So that's uh, Dahl's direct coercion, that's Bachrach and Barrett's agenda setting, and that's um, Luke's uh, thinking about ideology and hegemony. And distribution does matter here. Who has what and how they use it makes a difference. But it is the processes that matter, perhaps more since it is the institutions, norms, and practices that are crucial here. Okay, so coercion. Coercion is okay. I'm still thinking about power and when it's okay to use it in a democracy and when it's not, because this is part and parcel of equality. Its coercion is okay in the Weberian sense, ensuring that the delegated authorities have the means to enforce the laws according to the prevailing rules and norms. It's democratically problematic when private individuals and groups take the laws into their own hands, when special interests undemocratically capturing part of the apparatus of the state. Agenda setting is another issue, crucial, crucial issue of one of the faces of power. We do set agendas. We want to ensure that those elected or appropriately appointed determined what the policies will be um, and who will be elected. There's a delegated responsibility, as I said, but it has to be responsive to public votes, demands, and, pre and pressures. Lobbying is not out of the question, but it is regulated, so it doesn't lead to subordinate influence. What we don't want in agenda setting is buying votes and influence. We don't want demagogues. We don't want non-democratic rules that block votes and voices. The hardest one is the third, what Luke's called hegemony and which we're not gonna call hegemony. We're using a contemporary term called mindset. And that's the hardest. We want to create a civic culture, something we've lost. A civic culture that recognizes the plurality of voices and the legitimacy of differences among us. We need that. We need that as part of our mindset as citizens. That doesn't mean there won't be differences. Politics is about conflict. It's about controversy. That's got to be part of that mindset, but it's got to be Civil, I don't mean it's not intense, but it's gotta be within this framework of a commitment to the common good, the public good, and a larger civic culture. What we don't want is mindsets in, that are the result of brainwashing, unfounded conspiracy theories, 
created and sustained biases that inhibit capacities and capabilities and undermine meaningful autonomy. And we're seeing a lot of that these days, once again, in democracies as well as in autocracies. Okay, so let me conclude. This is my last set of words for right now. So here's what Tim and Pablo and I hope to show. That political equality is a worthy ideal and an intrinsic good. That it's important and instrumental for democracy. It supports democracy, but is also created by democratic rules. We can measure aspects of it and assess how well we are doing. That's our hope. But there are always trade-offs, and we want to be able to begin to identify what some of those trade-offs look like and what we're losing and what we're gaining. More political equality means more voices, which means plurality and wisdom of the crowds, good things. But also more contestation can be a good thing if done civilly, but it can lead to polarization and an intensification of uneven preparation for the vote. We cannot ever assure that all will use their voice equally. There are those who will choose not to participate and they have that right in a democracy. Um, even when a vote is compulsory, there are people who can figure out how to get around it and not, you know, not really demand much. But we can try to ensure that everyone has the right and capability and possibility to participate and to, to get their voices heard. That's what we hope to find. But we may learn that political equality is a nearly impossible goal or undermines rather than supports Republican forms of democracy or something even more surprising. But whatever we find, the effect will we hope, this is our really deep hope, will make government processes more participatory, representative, and responsive, whatever we end up calling the system. Thank you. Oh, more water over there. Margaret, I'm not sure if you're supposed to get the pink microphone and I get the blue one, but uh, who cares? Uh, I care. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Thank you very much for this. I've got questions. And if you've got questions, you can put them on the cards and, and send them over. And we'd love to uh, fit them into the discussion. And we'll, we'll go to about 10 after. So we'll have 20 minutes uh, before you uh, are free for dinner. But uh, let me ask you the, the, the following question to sort of uh, to begin. You didn't talk much at all about non-democratic countries yeah. in the course of this. But, you know, there are democratic countries, there are countries, non what we would consider non-democratic countries which would claim to actually be achieving political equality as you conceive of it better than democracies. Where do they fit into the mix? We've actually debated that. It's not a question we haven't confronted. Um, and if you know the work of all of us, several of us have in fact dealt with non-democratic countries, but we decided that the issue is sufficiently pressing in democracies as we understand them. And the concern about the future of democracies is, is sufficiently pressing that we, you know, you can't do everything and we wanna do something well, some piece of it. And as I said, lots of questions will be left unanswered at the end. Um, so there is gonna be some hand waving to some of the non-democratic countries. Um, we had an argument with Tim early on, both Pablo and I sided against him about including Russia in the study because they do have elections. They do claim a certain kind of political equality. And we just really felt that we had to contain the study to something that was at least partially manageable. It's already pretty big. So that's the reason. Well, then let me- let A me, narrow social science argument. Well, let me push you on another uh, question of scope conditions then, if you don't mind. So uh, when we think about economic equality, you know, one thing that people who are, uh, uh, some people are concerned about economic equality, and, and, and one response to inequality in a society is arguments about mobility, an argument that, you know, as unequal as the United States might be, 
it's an, I'm not saying this, but the argument is it's, it's an acceptable inequality because there actually is quite a lot of economic mobility. So someone who is born at the bottom of the distribution has a chance of getting to getting higher up in the distribution. You can quibble over the, the uh, empirics of that, but let's take it as an example, sort of as a, as a counter argument. Is there an argument for political mobility? The idea being that, you know, it's in a society over time, as parties move around and as they compete for support and as ideas change, you will never have fully equal voice for everyone. But what we should care about is the capacity of any, the chance of anyone to, to be able to, uh, at some point, have more voice than they had before. And I do think that is one of the baselines that, you know, what we're looking at right now in many countries, the U.S., a prime example of that, is various ways in which blockage of certain groups and their voices continues to persist. Um, we've seen throughout many states in the United States efforts to delimit the suffrage again, to restrict it in a variety of what I find totally unacceptable ways, not to take a normative position here, but totally unacceptable ways. Um, and all based on some weird notion of democracy. But that's what we don't want to have. That's clearly unacceptable. There has to be political mobility. There has to be a chance for a Black man to be president, a Black woman to be gov governor, a gay man to hold uh, office or whoever. Um, and for a long time in the history of democracies, women did not have the suffrage. I think Australia was the first country that gave suffrage at its origin to women. Um, so women were blocked from suffrage. We know that people of color, migrants in a variety of ways have been blocked from suffrage. That seems to me the low hanging fruit of political equality. That's at least a minimum that all people who we sh think should be citizens and you know people who are being denied the suffrage in the United States are in fact considered citizens but they're now being told they have to come, you know, meet other hoops or they're being restricted in their vote by weird kind of gerrymander. But it's about more than just, uh, what you're talking about is about more than just the capacity to vote, right? It, it is about the, it's about the, uh, the likelihood in some sense that, that your opinion will matter That's and it right. will matter consistently. And that you can run for political office and actually have a chance of winning that you can enter a legislature and not be ignored even though you won. Those are all parts of the story. So I want to talk a little bit about technology and I'm going to go to one of the cards, questions on the cards, but, but in your old job at, uh, at Caspis, for those who don't know, it sits up on a hill overlooking Silicon Valley. It's a place that was, when you're in that part of the world, people think a lot about technology and there's a lot of utopia about the capacity of technology to make society better. And it's, there's some there's some meat there, but there's also a lot of uh, there's a lot of filler too, isn't there? But uh, in some ways, in self promotion. But early on in the paper, you talk a lot about which you didn't talk about so much in the talk, but talk about kind of the the quality of deliberation between people yeah. and the idea that political equality would be about people's preferences being heard and their preferences being understood by other people, and that sort of the democratic conversation would be fuller with more with more participants. In some ways, technology should have solved this for us, right? The, the capacity of technology to reveal our preferences to us and to help us understand what we want and then to share with other people and to equalize that because it reduces the cost of it so much. You know, the hope would be that this would actually increase political equality dramatically, right? It certainly increased the capacity of our consumer preferences to be known, right? But why isn't, why isn't there put it this way, I will. Why isn't there a killer app for, for political <laughs> equality yet? Well, I think with, with there are some apps <laughs> and there certainly are a lot of experiments going on. And I think that's where we are right now. I mean, I think democracy in not all countries, but in most countries that have been experimenting with democracy for a long time are coming up against limits of the kinds of rules and institutions that were established in one era for the kind of era in which we currently live, for the kind of voices that are currently trying to be express themselves, um, for the capacities and capabilities that people have to get to where their voice can make a difference and to organize it in a way so that it can make a difference. And so what we're seeing all over the world are some very exciting experiments um, in forms of 
uh, participatory budgeting, in terms of uh, electing legislators by lottery, um, in trying all kinds of computer techniques to create participation and conversations, not only to get out the vote, but also to create new kinds of communities, new kinds of organizations, new forms of mobilization. I think all of that is incredibly exciting. I think it, we're just at the beginning of it. And it's happening in a period when there is a lot of energy for innovation, but there is also a lot of resistance to innovation as we're seeing. I mean, that's, that's back to the story of who's blocking the suffrage of people who've won the suffrage. Um, you know, there is, there is something, there's a backlash going on as well as an attempt at innovation. And I think we're in a very interesting moment of political struggle and contest. And I don't know where it's going to go, I have to say, but I'm hopeful that you young people will get it together with these new technologies and make the changes that need to be made. And I do think it will rely in part on technology. I think that's a way in which people relate to each other across all kinds of divides. Yeah, it flattens all sorts of distance between people, yeah. right? That didn't, or shrinks distance between people to use the right, the right metaphor. So there's a great question on, on, on the card here, which is largely to one of our students. And it's largely about sort of a kind of paradox of, polar, of polarization. So as politics has become more polarized, take the, the American example, arguably in a more polarized system, you have more of the features of democratic equality. The politicians are, they, they know what people's preferences are better because those preferences are organized more coherently. Um, they're listening to them more because they're trying to get to this very, this group of people who are not persuadable, but whose preferences are well known, so they can be appealed to directly. But there's a, just a huge divide between people on different sides. But it seems like in the United States right now, there is this feature where, you know, Republican politicians know exactly what Republican voters want, and they're giving it to them. And Democratic politicians seem to be doing the same. What's missing is some kind of persuadable middle, right? But is there a sort of a paradox of, of polarization that on the one hand, it makes it easier for politicians to listen and be responsive to their voters. But on the other hand, it's kind of, and those voters know each other better, by the way, right? Yeah, yeah. But no. there's a, a deep disagreement there and, and, and a deep sort of, I mean, it's an apparent unhealthiness in it, right? So is polarization good or bad for <laughs> democratic equality? The form of polarization that we're experiencing in the US is not good for democracy. Why? Um, because it's not really based on a clean polarization for two different reasons. One, it's a very, in, I think in both, more in the Republican case, but also in the case of part of the left of the, uh, in the Democratic Party, it's a very well-organized and articulate minority, even of the Republican voters. I mean, with the abortion question that Dobbs has really put in front of us all, we're seeing a lot of Republican shift, that that, 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 that significant, that minority of Republicans who have very extreme positions is in fact a minority. Now, whether it translates into change in the midterms, again, I'm not good at predictions of that sort, but I think there's at least an opportunity that it will. And we're also seeing the extreme positions on the left as we have in the past as well having that same effect. It speaks to a well-organized minority, but it's not really the public. That's one way in which I think this form of polarization is unhealthy. The other is it's, it's creating enmity where it doesn't have to be, because in fact, most of us have a variety of things that we're interested in. And we have positions that we share with people who disagree with us about something else. And we saw that around the LGBT issues and the marriage equality questions, where suddenly a whole group of people came overnight. The mindset changed because people who had grown up believing that um, being different in that way was a problem suddenly realized their children were different in that way or their uncle. And it suddenly crossed those divides. And I think there are a lot of issues out there. I mean, economic insecurity is not just a Democratic or a Republican problem. So finding ways to address that and speak to that 
can cross those divides. So part of this is a problem with our institutions and part of it is a problem with the failure of a certain kind of responsiveness on the part of our representatives. It is, there, is it, uh, so it's a failure of responsiveness on the part of representatives to essentially uh, allow themselves to be limited in the conversation to just this narrow band of issues that separate people. Right. So what's the, is there, is there a role for elites in generating political equality? You don't talk about that much in the, in the, in the paper, right? In some sense, the paper's asking just how well do elites do the job of looking like us and doing what we want, but there's, there's not much in the paper about what the proactive role the elites, what is a proactive role the elites can be taking, should be taking if they can to actually expand our sense of, of, of political equality. Does more of it come from elites doing an expansion from the bottom up or some combination of both? I think it's a combination of both. And here I'll, I'll go back to some work you know that I've done on labor unions in the interest of others, which is um, trying to understand why different unions have really evoke very different cultures, as it were, political cultures and mobilization. And this was all looking at unions in the transport sector, but they were so teamsters, truckers, and um, longshore dock workers. And in both cases, um, the members of the unions demographically were pretty much the same. And in both cases, the unions represented politically diverse perspectives. But in one set of cases, the ways in the, the way in which the constitution of the union was created and the kind of leadership role that it provided um, was they were very different. So one was a very top-down leadership. The other had real leadership. There's no question about that, but they were their feet were really held to the fire by their membership. There was a kind of participatory democracy. These are the longshore workers on the West Coast of the US and in Australia. Um, and the leadership played a crucial role in, in creating the constitution and in sustaining it. I'm using constitution here as, you know, setting up the initial rules of the game, the sort of Philadelphia moment of these unions, which was in the 1930s. Um, what they did was create a role for socialization, for a certain kind of socialization in the case of the unions that evoked pro-social behavior. It was one, you have to learn about the world. You have to see what's really happening in the world, not just assume it, not just believe what you believe. We're gonna give you opportunities to learn. You obviously make your own choices about what you think about that, but you're gonna have the opportunity increasing capabilities, increasing the capacity to understand what's happening out there. Two, we encourage you to argue about it. You don't think that's right, or you don't think that's the way the world really is, argue about it, convince each other, persuade each other have a talk about it, discuss it. That's part of the socialization. And three, you have an issue, bring it to the whole membership. Let's talk about it as a whole. It's not just educating you in this particular domain about the world and what you think it is, but it becomes part of your practice in the union to actually do that, to engage as a participant. That's part of your responsibility as a citizen, as a member of this polity who's gonna vote on contracts. And what it led to was people being willing to think about engaging in very costly actions, might lose them their jobs, might get them sent to jail or prison for a brief period, might get them beaten up by the police, but they engaged in actions that were to benefit others who could never reciprocate, often far distant others who could never reciprocate. That's the kind of civic culture that I'd like to see built. And that required both leadership institutions and a culture that is created that requires participation and it will not be sustained if it's just the leadership doing it top down. It's a great example. I've got two last questions for you off the cards. Um, and the first I, I, I ask in the interest of others because I'm a big advocate of not changing our voting system. But the question is, uh, which systems of voting in government do you think maximize political equality? That for me is an empirical question. And it's, it's been a long debated question about which ones are most efficient and which ones decrease you know, certain kinds of polarization, which ones provide more access to more publics. Um, and as we know, that debate continues every time you think you got it. My mother was convinced, my mother is now long deceased, but 
she was convinced for a long time that the Israeli parliamentary system was the best in the world. It managed to cover up all those conflicts among the Israelis. She didn't die thinking that. She lived part of her life thinking that, and then the system just fell apart. You know, for a long time, I think a lot of people thought, despite its limits, the American system had great benefits. I think a lot of us are wondering about that right now and whether it's reached, it's really got to change or it's, we're going to get something totally different than democracy. So I'm not sure there's, and that's why I said there might be multiple equilibria and you have to think about it both across countries and you know what the history of those countries are, what the context, what the current demography of those countries are, but and the current politics of those countries are, but you also have to look at it across um, place and time. So we have, again, the last question comes from uh, Akanksha Mathur, who's one of our MPP students, who asks, but I'm gonna ask the question in a slightly different way, but her, uh, their question is about uh, uh, why, why we rely on quantitative data when qualitative data will be much richer, but I want to, on questions of what equality means, but I want to ask the question to you in a slightly different way. Because I because I know something about you that not everyone else knows here, which is that you are uh, a, a big art collector, which is to say you have one of the largest collections of Indigenous Australian art in the world, uh, in North America, and you're very serious about collecting it. I know you're a person who, when you are thinking through political problems and social science questions, will read novels to, to try to conceptualize what you're thinking about. So what's the what what's the, the the piece of art you're looking at, or the or the books that you're reading, outside of all this data that's really you're using to spark your imagination about what it means to think about political equality and what it is? Well, you know, as you say that, I, I'm sorry, I have to come back to the book that I wrote that in, that on consent, dissent, and patriotism that included Canada, and uh, looked at the controversy between over the conscription in the First World War and the and volunteering for military service in the First World War and the Second World War, particularly focusing on Ontario and Quebec. And in order to understand the perspectives of the two different provinces, I read a huge number of novels that were written during that period, express, during those two wars or leading up to them, expressing the kind of politics and the kind of societies and the kind of cultures that were there. I can't remember the names of all of them now. I just packed them up recently. Um, but I really want to come back not to just what novel I'm reading now about political equality because I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I do think the qualitative statistical question is an important one. So my view is it's not just one or the other. It's never just one or the other. Every piece of work I've always I've ever done, I'm a qualitative researcher in this group, but it's not that Pablo's never done it or Tim's never done it. They both have. They both pay attention to that. It's not that I've never done statistical work or game theoretic work I have, but the best way to get at these problems is multi-method, multi-dimensional. Statistics tells you part of the story, qualitative tells you part of the story, neither tells you all the whole of the story. In fact, nothing ever tells you the whole of the story, but both of them and other things are essential components if you're gonna really get a picture, particularly if you're gonna get a picture of what it means, what the social interactions are like. You can't capture those totally with statistics. That has to be in part qualitative. That really does need another kind of data. And there's very rich data about, I mean, think about Kathy Kramer Walsh, Kathy Kramer's book on Wisconsin or uh, the, the book by Arlie Hochschild on Louisiana and why people come to the kinds of political decisions that they do, even though it seems to be against their economic self-interest in some cases. But if you don't understand deeply the kind of religion, religious beliefs they have, the kind of culture that they live in, the way they feel about their piece of the earth. You don't understand why they're making the choices that they're making. And if you don't understand why they're making the choices that they're making, the statistics won't help you. Margaret, we're gonna have much more of a chance to talk about your paper and your, your research more broadly tomorrow. Uh, for graduate students who want to come uh, and you haven't signed up yet, 12 to 2 in uh, the boardroom at 3.15, you're welcome to come. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I have to draw things to a close. So I want to ask all of you to uh, to join me in thanking Margaret uh, Levy. Thank you.